Now let's move from the Word of God in its sacramental form to the Word of God read and preached. Tim spoke to me about baptism before we left on our vacation. That's why we set the date for today. And that afternoon I decided I was going to do something a little bit different this morning by preaching a sermon entitled Thoughts on the Baptism of Believers' Children. It's kind of got a Puritan tone to it, doesn't it? And for my text, I'm choosing, I guess I need to turn this off, don't I? Choosing Romans 4, verses 9 through 12. This is the word of the Lord. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. I'm going to ask you to indulge me in a bit of autobiography. When I became a Christian, probably around the age of 20 or so, I rebelled against all things Roman Catholic, which was the church that I grew up in. So you might say, even though I wouldn't have thought of it this way then, I had my own personal mini reformation. And high on my list of church failures, probably just below the fact that we were never taught that we could be saved by grace through faith, was infant baptism, which in my opinion had done incalculable harm to millions, tens of millions of deluded churchgoers who believed that somehow their baptism as an infant had saved them. So, though they had no ability to express their faith when the priest put the water on them, nevertheless, their baby baptisms led them to think that they were saved. Sadly, the Reformation, as I believed, perpetuated that delusion by accepting a church tradition accepting a church tradition pretty much uncritically, a church tradition that, contrary to the very principles of the Reformation, had no warrant in Holy Scripture. And so Protestants continued to baptize babies. And as I reasoned, it was no doubt to make them good citizens of the respective European countries in which they lived in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries and forward. I mean, they had to, right? Where there are state churches, there must be state Christians. When the nation and its people share one unifying religion, then church and state are, are coextensive. 
Now, I'll remind you that as a brand new Christian, I was a real prodigy. I knew all about the Bible, even though I hadn't read it through yet. And more than that, I knew all about church history, even though I'd never studied it. I had that special knowledge, that intuition, where if I just took a couple of ideas that resonated with me emotionally, I could extrapolate from that intuition grand schemes of theology and church history. I wish you only knew me then. <laughs> now I'm bookish and I have to study and it's boring. The Baptists saw through all of this and went all the way in their reforming activity. They returned, as I saw it, to the primitive Christian faith when a conscious belief in Christ was necessary for baptism. I didn't know anything about Anabaptists. I didn't know who Anna even was. It turned out that I married one, not Anna. And I had no idea that not all Baptists required what was so obviously the New Testament ordinance, faith in Jesus Christ followed by immersion. Not all Baptists hold to that. I don't know if you know that. I didn't. So on a mission trip to Florida, when my Youth with a Mission team was traveling to Key West, I was finally properly rebaptized by immersion by our team's leader right there in the Atlantic Ocean where it meets the Gulf of Mexico. And somewhere in my office, I have a photo of me coming out of the water, I think, uh, experiencing what I thought then was my new life. There was nothing so obvious to me than the doctrine of Believers only baptism and only by immersion. <clears throat> and my first Orthodox Presbyterian pastor sort of confirmed that, that intuitive <clears throat> reading of the New Testament when he told me that if anyone sits down to do a New Testament concordant study, on the bapt words, right, baptism, baptize, etc., they will inevitably become Baptists. Well, fast forward 44 years or so, and I'm still a believer, and I frequently visit specific Catholic YouTube sites and I found one that interacted with John MacArthur. And they played a clip of John MacArthur saying some things about baptism that I would have said, well, 44 years ago. Quote, in fact, from about the fourth century on now, infant baptism has been the norm in the Christian church. The Reformation in the 1500s didn't change that. So in that sense, it was an incomplete reformation. I could have said the exact same thing verbatim. Mm -hmm. Scripture nowhere advocates, advocates or records any such thing as the baptism of an infant. It is therefore impossible to support infant baptism from the Bible. It is not in the Bible. There's not an incident of it. And I recount that story. It, I just saw this clip when I came back from vacation, and the Lord always seems to drop either articles or YouTube clips in my lap for sermons that I'm preparing. I'm, I'm, I'm referencing this first because John MacArthur says what I once said 
but also I had to comment on it. And I had to comment in support of the Roman Catholic view. Now, no one panic. Not their entire baptismal theology. No, not at all. But insofar as identifying who are the proper recipients of baptism, I had to say, I'm a former Catholic, I'm a Presbyterian minister, and I think you guys are right on that point. Now, I'm not going to rehearse this morning my own journey, journey, to infant baptism. I will say that not only am I deeply committed to it now, I would consider it as ecumenical as I may be for a Presbyterian, a non-negotiable if I were to go to any other denomination. And when I do visit Baptist churches, and this isn't a slander, but I feel like there's something missing. And what's missing is the idea of an inclusive covenant that traces its history at least back to Abraham, if not before Abraham. Also, if I were to rehearse my journey, that would require a fairly deep dive into covenant theology, particularly as Meredith Klein taught it to me my first year in seminary. So I will say this, the Baptists argue that the New Testament only commands that people who repent and believe in Jesus be baptized. The New Testament never ever commands the baptism of babies. I argue in reply that the New Testament never ever commands God's people to cease including their children, their babies, their infants in the covenant community. And my redemptive historical argument, my argument from the story, is even stronger than their New Testament argument. And to throw in a dash of hyperbole, or maybe not, forbidding our children's membership in the covenant community, the church, would require in the New Testament an act of God similar to the one Peter witnessed at Cornelius' house in order for him to be persuaded that Gentiles were now to be counted among the people of God. Indeed, keeping our children out of the community while allowing Gentiles into it makes the Baptist position all the stranger. We become more inclusive in one respect, but more exclusive in another. But of course, at the end of the day, everything in this matter depends on how we, we read the scripture. And so for that, let's turn to Romans 4. And my first point is, there is not a drop of water in Romans 4. There is not a drop of water in Romans 4 not in the passage I read, not in the whole chapter. In fact, there's not even a drop of water in Romans. At least if you were just doing a search on the word water, there's no water in Paul's letter to the Romans. And so I'm going to admit to you up front that that may seem ooh, a wee bit inconvenient for the case that I'm bringing this morning, but hear me out because my choice of Romans 4, 9 through 12, is part of my autobiographical reflection. So you could picture me standing here going like this while the black and white scene of my history shows up behind me. That's where it begins. While I was still in seminary, 
I considered applying for a position at a small Baptist church in New Hampshire in order to provide them with regular pulpit supply. Of course, the problem was I was a Presbyterian student. I was fully on board by that point. And so I talked to David Gordon about it. And I only mention his name because so many of you either know him or know about him. And he thought it was a fine idea for me to at least attempt to apply for that position as long as both parties agreed up front that we would avoid the baptism issue. It's just pulpit supply after all. Included in his conversation with me was a reference to Romans 4. Uh, that would be, I, I think he said, my memory's a little fuzzy at this point, a little fuzzy, <laughs> um, that we would have to, to disagree about Romans 4, 9 through 12. Well, I hadn't ever thought about Romans 4, Roman 4's contribution to the baptism debate. So again, if I recall correctly, I went to the passage later on to see how it might apply and discovered, found out that what he said made perfect sense. No, there's no water in Romans 4. More importantly, there is a way of thinking that is deeply rooted in the redemptive historical story, in the world of biblical religion, that is, within our revealed religion that indirectly speaks to the issue of baptism. Does this way of thinking, of seeing God's world and God's covenantal dealings with his people in his world line up with, say, a roughly post-1600 Western way to see the world? No, not at all. That's the problem. That's the rub. Christians must conform their thinking to their maybe new or maybe 44-year-old uh, acquaintance with the redemptive historical story in order to think biblically, or as Cornelius Van Til put it, to think God's thoughts after him, to, to mold our minds to revealed religion. And so we look to the Bible as the source for the, the teachings, the ideas, the worldview, to conform us to God's way of seeing the world. And that brings me to my second point this morning. Romans 4 in the story of redemption. Romans 4 in the story of redemption. Here is a simple point. Romans 4, let's make it 4, 1 through 12, this context, is a locus classicus, an authoritative text for the doctrine of justification by faith alone as an Old Testament doctrine. It is an authoritative passage for the doctrine of justification by faith alone, which for us in the Reformed community means the imputed righteousness of Christ as an Old Testament doctrine. It was a doctrine first articulated in, a, yes, a more primitive form way back in Genesis chapter 15. And as Paul rehearses 
the, this Old Testament background in chapter 4. He also points out that though it's stated differently, it's found in David's experience in Psalm 32. You might remember now what Paul said to the Galatians as he reflected on his confrontation with Peter and how Peter was denying the truth of the gospel and stood condemned, Paul said, we ourselves, that is we Jews, or we Paul and Peter, or we Paul, Peter, and maybe Barnabas and the other Jews who defected, we ourselves are Jews by birth, we're not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, how did they know that? It was because it was found in Genesis chapter 15 and in Psalm 32, for instance. Now, because modern Protestants equate justification by faith with the gospel, mm. let's call it what it is. Mm. The gospel in Romans chapter 4. Mm. Abraham was justified by faith alone and apart from the works of the namas, of the law, which in retrospect may be a little bit obvious because there were no works of the law to perform. The law came some 450 years after Abraham. And yet, consistent with God's redemptive covenant, this is not a generic religion after all, Abraham received the sign of circumcision, the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. So, for the sake of the larger conversation, justification by faith alone and the gospel are virtual synonyms. Abraham received righteousness by faith. So, again, in modern terminology, Abraham got saved in Genesis 15. Abraham went forward at the altar call in Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, Abraham prayed the sinner's prayer. In short, that's when Abraham became a Christian. I know this is anachronistic, but I'm doing that intentionally. And so consistent with the redemptive covenant, Abraham received the sign of circumcision signifying to him as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. Hmm. And in the event, two chapters later, just two chapters later, even though quite a bit of time has passed, God actually signified and sealed Abraham's righteousness by faith by requiring Abraham to make a, no doubt, painful cut to his foreskin. And that's what we find. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who had faith without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who were not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. And so in Genesis 17, 
I'll read it to you, beginning in verse 12. Nope, sorry, verse 10. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between you and me. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Oh, ho. hold up there, chief. He who is eight days old shall be circumcised? That is, he who is eight days old shall receive the sign and seal of the righteousness that Abraham had by faith? Now, I'm not a pediatrician, but I'm pretty sure that an eight-day-old boy falls under the infant category. And I think, and uh, this isn't a full-blown teaching on paedo-baptism, but I think we can all agree that water baptism has replaced circumcision as the new covenant's sign and seal of justification by faith, can't we? In fact, it's more inclusive, is it not? We had three young boys come up today, but on another day we might have three young girls come up to receive the sign and seal of the righteousness by faith. Anyway, let's keep going on in Genesis 17, 10 through 14. See, where are we? He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now I stressed there, born in your house, born in your house. The house language, we often find the word household replacing the word house, which is typically perfectly appropriate. Um, but house language should be familiar to any believer who has spent any time reading through their Bibles. We find it as early as Genesis 7-1, Yahweh said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your house. For I have seen that you, Noah, singular, are righteous before me in this generation. But you and your house can enter the ark. And it goes all the way through, at least to say, Paul's recollection in 1 Corinthians 1.13, where thinking back to his ministry in Corinth, he says, I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. You might see it there as household, but I stress house because it's the same word that's used all through the Greek Bible. I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone. Now, there is a term to describe this type of biblical terminology. It's used in more scholarly debate, though it's not a scholarly term per se. It's called the oikos formula. I got this from Lee Irons, by the way. He has a, an article on his website, and I got this phrase from him, the oikos formula. 
The oikos formula, oikos means house, is so common in biblical Greek that debates about whether there were infants in Stephanus's house or Lydia's house, for that matter, Acts 16, or the Philippian jailer's house in Acts 16, all those arguments are irrelevant. This, that is a modern debate based on what I'm suggesting is an unbiblical way to read the Bible. Neither Paul nor Luke adds a footnote after the word oikos to the effect that the word house should not be taken to mean that there are infants in it. And if they did add that footnote, they would be bringing us out of the biblical story. In other words, it doesn't matter whether there were infants in this or that house. It's the language itself that matters. So strictly speaking, and I'm saying this in a friendly way, I'm not, I don't want to be too nasty with my Baptist uh, cousins. Baptists with infants and toddlers should not be allowed to hang on their kitchen walls, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. They'd have to amend that. But as for me and my house, comma, or at least those in my house who have come to faith, we shall serve the Lord. That may sound a little snarky, but strictly speaking, that's how it should go. So no, there's not a drop of water in Romans 4. But if we think of the redemptive story as, well, as a river whose headwaters are in the earliest chapters of Genesis, then that's the river in and on which Paul lives, floats. That's the stream. That's, that's where he, like a fish, breathes. It is a river that is as familiar to him as the Mississippi was to Mark Twain. We crossed the Mississippi recently. And like the mighty Mississippi, it's an old, it's even an ancient river whose course cannot be easily changed. But Baptists who exclude their infants and children from the covenant are either trying to dig new channels in the river or they're trying to dam it up completely because of how they read the New Testament independently of the story of redemption. The river stopped with John the Baptist, with Acts chapter 8, 10, I'm not sure. Scripture nowhere advocates, advocates or records any such thing as the baptism of an infant, said John MacArthur. And that may be true if we take out our Strong's Concordance and do a word search on the words infant and baptism. But if we read the repent and believe commands in the New Testament as the absolute and forever conditions for baptism, then we are not only overlooking the whole history of redemption, we are also ignoring the missionary nature of the New Testament church. What would you say to first generation Christians if you were to go to the 1040 window and preach to people who have never heard of Jesus Christ and they said, what must we do to be saved? You'd say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. A week later they say, 
What about my kids? By analogy, Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 are, quote, the mis missionary passage or passages in the Old Testament. Abraham is a brand new believer who is saved by faith. And so, as someone who is saved by faith, he undergoes circumcision as a first generation convert. Genesis 17, 12 does not say, he who also believes among you shall be circumcised. No, it speaks directly to the question, how should the, how should the baptized first generation believers treat their second generation children or even their newborns? He who is eight days old. We'll close with Heidelberg 74 again. Are infants also to be baptized? And remember, my old view, when I was much smarter, was that the Reformation, they hadn't really thought this out. They just accepted infant baptism and ran with it. This is a pretty well thought out catechism question, and it's backed by a great deal of scholarship. And of course, Heidelberg is mid-16th century, so they were on their game. Are infants also to be baptized? And remember, what is baptism? It is, how is it signified and sealed to you? The sign and seal, right? That's holy baptism. What about our infants? Yes, for since they, as well as their parents, belong to the covenant, and people of God, and through the blood of Christ, both redemption from sin and the Holy Ghost, who works faith, are promised to them no less than to their parents. They are also by baptism, as a sign of the covenant, to be engrafted into the Christian church and distinguished from the children of unbelievers. And this is what I think just made Joe's baptism this morning, just a wee bit extra special. Joe's come out of one world, that is one family. He's entered into a new one. Is that it? Why is it so hard to even reason, even apart from our emotions, to see that if you've left one situation, you've entered into a new family, don't you get a new identity? Doesn't he have a last name that rhymes with Ran B? Right? Doesn't he have the privilege now and the security and the comfort of being in a home where Christ is honored, but where he's taken care of, and all the ordinary things? Doesn't it, doesn't it just feel right? And that's a Presbyterian asking that question. Doesn't it feel right to teach Joe to pray the Our Father? Joe, we're going to learn the Our Father, but you really can't mean this until you become a Christian, because he's not your father. But when, when you become a Christian, then you can start praying it. So memorize it now, use it later. No. They're distinguished from the children of unbelievers, as was done in the Old Testament by circumcision, in place of which, in the New Testament, baptism is appointed. Are infants also to be baptized? Yes, of course they are. Let's pray. Father, as we reflect on that theme, that thread of uh, grace throughout Holy Scripture, 
that your people have appropriated by faith alone, apart from their works, lest they boast. We think as well of your kind dealings with a world where you created families in order to create environments, households, where the name of God and the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be honored. It does not guarantee that our children will grow up and be Christians or be Christians right away, but it is a special privilege all by itself. If we were to only look at households where, that are barren of any religion, let alone the Christian religion, we would see just how precious a thing it is. And so, our Father, we're thankful that you have ordained this sacrament to us and to our children. And we do pray, our Father, that even as we prayed for the Van Zee children, we pray for all of our children, whether they are young or old, that they may continue in their faith in Jesus Christ or perhaps return to their faith in Jesus Christ according to your kindness and grace revealed in him. And now we pray, visit with us at the family table as we come together to share a meal, a meal that acknowledges that we were helpless, we were weak, we were without strength when Christ died for us, and yet Christ died for us in order to return us to you and demonstrate that your love triumphs over our wickedness and rebellion. So meet with us at the table as a way to impress upon us freshly that we mean a lot to you and you mean everything to us, even as our Savior, Jesus Christ, separated this meal from its ordinary to its sacred use. We thank you and now ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us to the end that we may know you Pray these things through Christ. Amen. I very often use the language of family or family meal because that's the image in the New Testament. When you see not only the night when Jesus was betrayed, who was with him? His friends. He calls them his friends. And he says, I have greatly desired to eat this Passover meal with you. And so it's a meal of friendship, of a kind of family. But by the time we see the Lord's Supper in Corinth, it is the family meal. It is the sanctified people coming together and probably without much distinction, not quite sure, moved from a common meal to the sacred meal as a way of acknowledging their new kinship. And so that's what takes place here at the Lord's Supper. We're acknowledging our kinship. This is a family meal. I'm a sacramentalist but sometimes the language of the sacraments can unintentionally overwhelm the simplicity and the familial nature of the meal. And so I always want to bring you back to that. It is not inaccessible except to the most righteous among you. It is for all of you who have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and according to our polity, have professed faith in him. And so as we come to the Lord's table today, let's reinforce what we saw earlier. The family is growing. We are a connected people in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we acknowledge that 
Jesus himself has made this a special, distinct, and holy community in the world. And so we come knowing who we are and why we are not like everyone else in the world. Of course, if you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then I'm going to ask you not to participate in the Lord's Supper today because it is a family meal. But to all the family members, rich and poor, weak and strong, struggling or succeeding, let's come together and enjoy what our Savior has provided for us here at the table.